Thank you for joining us for today's Foundation for Defense of Democracies event. I'm Ambassador Eric Edelman, a member of the Board of Advisors at FDD's Center on Military and Political Power. I was honored to co-chair the bipartisan and congressionally mandated 2018 National Defense Strategy Commission alongside former Chief of Naval Operations and retired Admiral Gary Ruffhead. That commission concluded that the security and well-being of the United States are at greater risk than at any time in decades and warned that America's ability to defend its allies, its partners, and its own vital interests is increasingly in doubt. If the nation does not act promptly to remedy these circumstances, the consequences will be grave and lasting. Since then, the United States has undertaken some important efforts to restore readiness and initiate the most important U.S. military modernization effort in decades. This modernization effort is far from complete, however, and our adversaries have not been standing still. Beijing and Moscow are fielding new capabilities that could enable both governments to achieve their political objectives with military force, as well as pursuing efforts in the so-called gray zone, both geographically and functionally, to the strategic disadvantage of the United States. Meanwhile, Iran is inching towards a nuclear weapons capability, North Korea is building its missile arsenal, and the Taliban and Al-Qaeda once again enjoy a terrorist safe haven in Afghanistan. With this context in mind, the Biden administration is currently in the process of drafting the 2022 National Defense Strategy. This document will guide Department of Defense activities for several years to come. I don't envy their task. As our panelists today note in their War on the Rocks piece last month, each of the five leading threats to the United States, and especially the threat from China, have only grown worse since 2018. Perhaps that's why Indo-Pacific Command noted in its Section 1251 report to Congress this year that the region's military balance of power continues to become, quote, more unfavorable, close quote. How should we think about the next national defense strategy, and how can it be made into a serious effort to coordinate and direct the department's ends, ways, and means, and garner strong bipartisan support? These and related topics are the subject of today's event, and we're excited to have some of the best U.S. defense policy and strategy experts here to engage in this discussion. They include Brian Clark, a senior fellow and director of the Center for Defense Concepts and Technology at the Hudson Institute, a career U.S. Navy submariner. He focuses on naval operations, electromagnetic warfare, autonomous systems, military competitions, and wargaming, and he's been my colleague in the past. Mackenzie Eaglin, resident fellow at the American Enterprise Institute, where she works on defense strategy, defense budgets, and military readiness. She also served as a colleague and staff member on the 2018 National Defense Strategy Commission and has worked both on Capitol Hill and at the Pentagon. Thomas Spohr, a retired Army Lieutenant General who serves as the Heritage Foundation's Director for National Defense Research. While in uniform, he held a number of assignments related to the defense budget, including the Army's Director for Program Analysis and Evaluation and Director for Force Development. And finally, uh, my colleague Brad Bowman, Senior Director of FDD's Center on Military and Political Power, where he focuses on U.S. defense policy and strategy. He served as a longtime Senate staffer, Army officer, and an assistant professor at West Point. The conversation is moderated by another former colleague, Gordon Lubold, who is the White House and national security reporter for the Wall Street Journal. A bit more about FDD before I turn over the floor to Gordon and his team. FDD is a nonpartisan research institute exclusively focused on national security and foreign policy. We accept no funds from foreign governments. For more information on our work, visit us at FDD.org or find us on Twitter at FDD. With that, over to you, Gordon, to begin the discussion. Thank you, Eric, for, for, for that great introduction. And I want to um, thank uh, the Foundation for Demo uh, Defense of Democracies and its Center for uh, on Military and Political Power for hosting this great conversation. Uh, we're going to try to move quickly and, and get to uh, as many questions and, and topics from uh, the four of you as, uh, as we can today. Um, I thought we could start, um, uh, Tom, by just uh, if you could kind of lay out what you think is the importance of, uh, of this uh, national defense strategy uh, and, and what do you hope to get from it? And then we'll go from there. Yeah, thank you very much, Gordon. So this is gonna be a very significant national defense strategy. The 2018 national defense strategy was 
you know, ex extraordinarily uh, important for the Department of Defense to orient themselves away from the global war on terrorism and start focusing on uh, great power competition. But it only went so far and it only could go so far because some of these ideas had not been developed. This is going to be the first national defense strategy that takes this idea of global, global power competition and really sharpens the pencil and puts, puts some ideas on, uh, out there about how we want to deter China, how do we want to deter Russia, some of the operational techniques and uh, concepts uh, that the Pentagon's going to use. And so in that regard, it could not be more important. It's going to be really a, a decisive statement by the Biden administration. How do they feel about national defense and where are they going to place the priority? So I'm, I'm uh, looking forward to it. And, and this group, we really wanted to get our thoughts out there uh, to shape that strategy, which should be underway right now. We're not hearing much about it, but presumably it's fast underway at the Pentagon. I know that, you know, with uh, love and respect for the, those who worked on the QDR over the years, the, the, the current NDS is, is a document that is often cited and uh, shows its relevance, its current relevance. Um, and, and so, you know, uh, can imagine uh, everybody hopes to get another one that equally is relevant, if not more so. Um, Mackenzie, uh, thanks for being here. Uh, you owned part of uh, of this piece that you uh, all wrote about, and uh, I wondered if you could kind of lay out what your view is of kind of what your next NDS, and also maybe how you make a distinction between uh, uh, problems and uh, threats, which is a, an important distinction, I think, uh, as we look at this. Yeah, thanks for hosting, Gordon. That's so nice of you, and thanks to my co-authors for a great effort. Um, as one of our colleagues said, nowhere in our article are we trying to get to less or doing more with less or even really, right, any of the sort of um, typical DC exercises, wordsmithing, you know, spending months wrangling over terms like Jeep great power competition. That's not what we are about. We're about making serious, big, bold statements and prioritizing and being honest about everything. And so, we believe that the core function of the department is deterring and winning wars. Sure, competition is important. It's part of deterrence, but deterring and winning wars is the foundational job of this federal agency, why it exists. And the department has to focus on doing that against its most capable opponents, right? So even though, you know, in the Cold War, we never fought at the fold gap, the military fought all kinds of small wars and conflicts all over the globe against our Cold War enemies. And so, you know, that's going to continue. And so the department that in some cases, Gordon, that requires, you know, it's not just duplicative. In some cases, there is an overlap. In some cases, you need to specialize investments and training and readiness if that's the cornerstone of the strategy. And we call for not, you know, this, this um, what I increasingly say is the conflation of national security problems and national security threats. You know, the Department of Defense's job is to look outward into the world and help keep Americans safe from those threats. And we have oodles of other agencies and organizations and governments, state, local, and federal, th whose job it is to protect Americans here at home. Sure, is there a homeland defense element to national defense? Yes, absolutely. But what I've seen in defense strategies over the years is that mostly they're additive. And this one, is, unfortunately, you know, we, we'll know soon, but um, this one may also be that. And they're additive without adding time, people, or resources. What do I mean by additive of national security problems? Well, we know the Secretary of Defense has said pandemic relief and response, including future pandemics, is a top priority for the department climate change and resiliency and you know green programs top priority for the department uh, and extremism diversity racism inclusion you know these 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 priorities as well and i i would argue that those don't need to make it into the final version Uh, do you want to expand on that a little bit, though? Because I think that that's, you know, we saw a lot of criticism from uh, uh, of General Milley when he spoke about, the, you know, kind of the woke, the wokeness. Um, you expand on that a little bit. And I, I do want to encourage everybody. I, I do want this to be a conversation. So uh, anybody else jump in uh, um, 
uh, any answer to that question or any others on, on this topic. Right. It doesn't mean those priorities aren't important or that the department can't care about climate change. It's not at all what it means, but it does mean that defense department leadership needs to make sure that they can do their most important job really well. And I'd argue they can't today. So focusing on prioritization um, of jobs and responsibilities, the most serious among them is to, to win the wars and doing that really well. That's that's arguably the top priority. Got it. Anybody else on that? Hey, Gordon, I'll jump in here. I, I, I completely, for what it's worth, agree with Mackenzie on that. I mean, it, uh, you know, we've all heard the colloquialism or the, the cliche phrase, you know, if everything's a priority, nothing's a priority. And the essence of strategy, as I understand it, is establishing priorities, right? I mean, resources are finite. You can't do everything. So what are you going to do? Well, as a country, we're going to do all kinds of things. But as Mackenzie's saying eloquently, what do we want the Department of Defense to, to do? I do believe we're in a great power competition, not with rivals, but with adversaries. We're in a great power competition with adversaries. And that competition involves all kinds of tools of national power, ideally integrated well together. But the Department of Defense's contribution to that competition, I would say, is to be able to do exactly what Mackenzie said, is to be able to, to deter and win wars. And if the DOD can do that, that's gonna make our other tools of national power more effective, particularly diplomacy, develops an economics. So competing currently in the cyber domain, the, the develop, the, all these, yes, most of the ongoing competition is in other domains. But meanwhile, undergirding all that should be a department of defense that no one wants to fight because they're so good at what they do. And, and, and if we drag the department of defense into all these important but peripheral areas, Ironically, we're going to be undercutting not only our ability to defend ourselves, but the effectiveness of all those other tools of national power. Fair point. Yeah, I think military leaders and others would, would say that the military is always the easy button. And so then people come to them for things that aren't even really shouldn't be necessarily in their wheelhouse. Brad, as long as I get you, do, do you want to talk a little bit about the threats uh, that uh, you laid out in, in, in the piece uh, and, and why, why are they more urgent than they were the last time? Sure. No, thank you. Um, you know, as the four of us wrote in our, our War on the Rocks uh, piece last month, um, the 2018 National Defense Strategy, right? So we're the 2022 one is being developed now. The last one we had was in, published in 2018. It identified, you know, five leading threats, China, Russia, Iran, North Korea, and terrorism. Uh, and, you know, the key point that I think we, may, we wanted to make in our piece was that if you if you bring a, a sober, objective, serious, and analytical effort to this, and you look at each one of those, China, Russia, Iran, North Korea, and terrorism, I think a compelling case can be made that each one of those five is worse now than it was in 2018. I mean, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll spare the, uh, the viewers running through each of those. You can read more about them in the piece, and you can do a five-minute Google search and basically see that each one of those is more formidable than it was four years ago. And so, um, why do we need to highlight that? Because, you know, I think, again, going back, I, I don't want to geek out here, but, you know, strategy, you begin with the end. You begin with the objective or the interest. What are we trying to accomplish? You identify the core threats to that, the, the most likely and most dangerous threats. And then from that, you establish your ways and means. But if you flip that on its head and you start with, okay, well, this whole exercise is going to be, uh, you know, we won't say it, but in reality, it's going to be an effort to justify a flat or reduced defense budget. I'm sorry, that's not strategy. That's a political document. Uh, and, and, you know, in, in, in previous times, maybe we could get away with that sort of silliness. But I'd say right now, the threats we confront, particularly from China, are so grave and so serious and really so urgent um, that if, if, if this administration delivers a national defense strategy like that, I, I do worry uh, the consequences could be quite significant. So um, if we objectively look at the threats, I think we're going to see that the 2018 National Defense Strategy Commission had it about right. And that is that we need three to 5% at least real growth in, uh, in, in the defense budget. And of course, we know the Biden administration requested a budget that didn't even keep up with projected inflation. So there's good reason, I think, to be concerned right now and to call for a real strategy. Uh, thank you, uh, Brad. We'll come back to some budget issues because I think obviously they are central to any discussion on strategy. Um, uh, China does seem to be the the kind of wolf closest to the door, the 25 meter target, whatever the uh, thing is. Uh, Brian, uh, you had uh, some contributions particularly on that. Do you want to uh, kind of walk us through how you see the China threat and how it emerges? 
Yeah, yeah. Thanks, Gordon. Um, the the issue with you know, with China is obviously it's the, the the highest priority we have facing you know the department right now from a defense strategy standpoint. Uh, but you know, it China looms large because it is the world's largest military by a lot of dimensions: largest navy, largest coast guard, largest maritime militia, um, largest army. Uh, it's the largest air force in the region. You know, so it's a huge military. It's increasingly capable. They're modernizing very rapidly. Um, they're in a position to where they can really exercise a degree of superiority and maybe even dominance over portions of the Western Pacific and, and East Asia um, that we're going to have to really uh, counter if we want to be able to protect our interests, mostly our allies uh, overseas. And I think, I don't know if the department and you know people in America really come to grips with the idea of a China that is uh, a peer of the United States technologically, militarily, um, and, and you know, in some ways, uh, geo geopolitically, right? So there's there's going to be a challenge that the department's going to face in terms of how to counter that, how to deter aggression against a country that really has the tools and the geographic proximity to exercise their will in a lot of ways in the Western Pacific. Um, you know, so it's not like the Soviet Union where they were behind us in terms of innovation and technology. Um, it, you know, it's a totally new bag of fish, right? So it's it's a it's a situation where we're facing essentially the British in, uh, if you will, uh, back in the 1800s when the United States and the British were in some ways peers. Um, so we're going to have to come up with new ways of deterring China that aren't just trying to dominate the region as we have with other competitors or other adversaries. We're going to have to come up with new concepts to try to fight in new different ways. We're going to have to try to in innovate technologically, and and most of all, we're going to have to uh, come up with a new uh, posture. That's going to be more robust and able to actually defend our allies forward, as as Brad has written about pretty eloquently. Um, all those things together are designed to raise the cost for the Chinese of, of aggression, um, reduce the benefits of aggression for them in the back end, uh, and then maybe come up with new ways to punish Chinese aggression on the, in the aftermath. Um, but you know, I don't. I think we need to get away from this idea of thinking about us being able to deny China its objectives in the Western Pacific because we're such a much more powerful, capable military. We are now at a place where we are peers and we're gonna to have to reconcile ourselves to that and come up with some more creative ways to, to counter them militarily as well as using other elements of national power, as Brad said. Good. Do you, just a quick on China, do you think, and you kind of touched on it, but do you think that their trajectory can be altered by the US or is it a question of the US figuring out how to adjust and counter on its own? Is there some interaction there that can affect it? I think, yeah, certainly I you would argue in terms of a long-term competition, there may be ways at the edges to try to adjust China's trajectory. It seems like what you're seeing today in China is um, they're adjusting their own trajectory by virtue of the decisions they are making internally. So, you know, their economy is a company, you know, it's kind of encountering the middle uh, income growth uh, slowdown that most countries experience. Um, they're having problems politically internal to the country. So there's some issues that China has brought on itself. And that's probably going to be much more of a determinant of its future trajectory than what the United States does. What we can do, what's in our control, is what we do in terms of how we posture our military, how do we operate our military, how do we uh, work with our allies to be able to provide, provide a united front um, so that you know, we raise the cost for China in terms of uh, acting aggressively in, in, in its neighborhood. Uh, and if you make the, the price high enough, then they're going to be less likely to pursue aggression. Um, I think we, but I think we need to be really sober and realistic about the capabilities China has and re remind ourselves that this is really us trying to prevent them from achieving something, not us you know, winning a war on, in the traditional way against China where you know, we roll into the capital and, and we take over at the end of it. Right. Um, uh, good. Um, I want to come back to some of that other stuff and allies is an important part of this whole conversation. We'll come back to it. Tom, I want to bring you into it. Um, uh, uh, obviously, um, deterrence is a, is a big uh, factor when it, uh, when it comes to building a strategy. Um, uh, what's your view of how the U.S. can build into its strategy an effective deterrent strategy and uh, and then execute it. Yeah, thanks, Gordon. And so after protecting the homeland, which is usually a function of missile defense and strategic nuclear deterrence, deterring our adversaries, in particular China and Russia, is really the main task that should be covered in this national defense strategy. And it's really about sending the message uh, to China. We'll, we'll take China for now that one, that the U.S. is committed to their defense, two, that we are you know, resolute, but most importantly, that we are committed and we are going to achieve a military balance of power that, that can allow them, uh, that can deny them their initial objectives. So let's take Taiwan, that we can deny them from taking over and holding Taiwan. And a lot of times in these national defense strategies, people 
lose sight of what we're actually trying to do. And we tried to bring that discussion back to that. One of the things that concerns us, all four of us, is that the Pentagon has been kind of test marketing this idea of something called integrated deterrence. And Secretary uh, Lloyd Austin, I think, rolled that out in Singapore. And he was talking about deterrence is more than military power. It involves economic sanctions and diplomatic sanctions and, and then military power. And on one level, you know, that's something the United States has always done. We have always used all instruments of power to kind of influence uh, potential adversaries. But on the other hand, it's deeply concerning because usually the Pentagon's job and what they talk about is maintaining a favorable balance of power in order to reinforce deterrence. And so when we have the Secretary of Defense saying that we should emphasize integrated deterrence, you know, which includes you know, stern diplomatic notes or economic sanctions, or maybe even nuclear deterrence, it causes all of us to be super concerned that we are gonna vacate this idea of maintaining a favorable military balance of power and rely on other things which are much less certain to actually influence Chinese behavior. And so it's, it's it, you know, kind of reminds me of the Biden administration saying that, hey, we're gonna ensure the rights of women in Afghanistan by maybe denying the Taliban international, you know, uh, recognition or something like that. And that ought to, that for sure ought to put the fear into them. And, you know, it's like, well, no, that, that is not something they recognize, you know, and what, what we think President Xi and his, probably his advisors recognize is a favorable military balance of power. So in this paper, we really tried to bring the discussion back to that and to leave elements like uh, economic sanctions for discussion at the national level, you know, in the national security strategy, not the national defense strategy. Interesting. Um, uh, this is a good segue to, uh, uh, to what I get excited about uh, in particular is, is how, you know, how do you do deterrence? Some would argue deterrence in the Middle East has, has not worked uh, to, to deter Iran. Uh, you know, uh, General McKenzie from Central Command, you know, likes his carriers and likes his other stuff in the region. And some would argue it doesn't really work. Um, uh, uh, we can go back to uh, uh, you, Brad, a little bit on on this. You know, uh, under the under the original pivot, or I don't know what pivot it was, but under the under the Obama pivot to Asia, you know, I think uh, it, it never was. It never, you know, kind of met its objectives necessarily. Uh, and but part of it was there were never a lot of forces that were put in there. There was there uh, there was this like expectation of all this military might that was going to be poured into the region. That never was. They may, they, you, uh, the Pentagon may be thinking about it differently now. One of the talking points is, well, we have already 376,000, whatever the number is, uh, military forces in Indo-PACOM. Most of those, a lot of them are in California uh, and Hawaii. Um, do you want to talk a little bit about how, uh, as, as we think about a strategy, uh, what needs to be brought to bear to the region physically, um, capabilities wise, and, and what that means? Sure. No, thank you. So we've talked a bit here about ends or objectives. We've talked about threats to those objectives. And, and I, I, you know, to bring to kind of to complete the picture, we have to talk about you know, means and ways. You know, what do you need, and how do you employ those 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 capabilities, capacities, and so forth. And one element of you know, in, in DC, a lot of times it's we focus on hardware because if you don't have the right hardware, you you can't fight the war. But it also matters where that equipment and those people are stationed. Uh, and I would argue that it matters more than ever now because we now confront adversaries, plural, particularly China, but also Russia, that um, are going right after the traditional American way of war. We, uh, anyone who's you know, probably older than 30 or 35 is kind of, uh, this assumes that the US military can deploy wherever we want on a schedule of our, of our choosing and, and initiate the war how we like and, and the, our adversaries just have to kind of accept all that. Well, that assumption is, is dead. That assumption is over, or, or it should be. And I think Americans need to, if they're not already awake to that fact, they need to wake up quick. And, and, and what, let me be more specific. You know, the, in, in Taiwan, for example, goodness forbid, if, there, if there's a, a conflict in the Taiwan Strait um, tomorrow, next month, next year, um, we cannot safely assume that, in my opinion, that we're gonna be able to surge reinforcements there uncontested from Guam, from Hawaii, from California, from wherever. 
we, that has been an assumption of, uh, of US contingencies and, and war planning for decades. And it is no longer a good assumption. I would assume that if shooting started in the Taiwan Strait and, and, and it was clear to Beijing that America was gonna start flowing in reinforcements and was actually gonna stand by our commitments and do something about it, I would be shocked if there weren't simultaneous cyber attacks on, 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 on US bases in the United States. I, I suspect our forces would be under attack in all different forms before they even left the ground in the United States and in route, right? And, and, and so this idea that we're gonna be able to safely, quickly and effectively surge forces into a contingency, whether it be in the Baltics against Russia or in the Taiwan Strait is no longer a good assumption. So what do you do with that? Well, there's kind of two schools of thought. One is this kind of, I, I almost view it as kind of a defeatist attitude. Well, we just better pull back because they're gonna pummel our forces in the first days you know, we just got to pull back. Oh, maybe we shouldn't do missile defense in Guam. We should just pull back, right? Or another approach, you know, I'm doing a little bit of a straw man there, but you know, you get the idea. Uh, another point is we need to strengthen the agility, survivability, and lethality of our forward forces to convince them not to do it in the first place. And based on the assumption what I already said, you cannot as safely assume you're going to be able to get vessels from San Diego or, or Pearl Harbor, uh, aircraft from, from the Midwest, and troops from, from Fort Lewis there in, in a relevant time period. So if it's all about deterrence, convincing them that they can't accomplish their political objectives at an acceptable cost, uh, then you have to get those forces forward uh, and, and, and sufficient uh, capability and capacity that they don't try to do it. And if they do try to do it, you'll be successful. And so if you buy what I'm saying, that has implications right now, not 10 years from now, right now for what we do in the first island chain, what we do with our NATO partners in the Baltics, and then, and then the Middle East is a whole nother discussion I'd love to get into if you have time. So. What do you mean, expand? I mean, uh, so where do you put them? Where do you, uh, where do you, where do you put them? How does it look different from the kind of conventional deterrence that we're thinking about in terms of capabilities and forces, but also the, the kind of other talking point typically is, okay, then now you're in the provocation mode. And so, yeah, yeah. where's the balance? It's a fair question. I'd love to bring in Brian on this in, in a second if he's willing, because he's focused on a lot and, and done really great work on this. But um, you know, I think you have to look at, as I said earlier, the most likely and most dangerous scenarios. And uh, when I look at the most likely and most dangerous scenarios in the Taiwan Strait, um, I, I put a premium on long-range precision fires that we need to have forward. I put a premium on missile defense. I put a premium on electronic warfare, cyber. Uh, uh, hardening our, our, our bases, agility of forces, these sorts of things. And I know McKen all, all three of my counterparts could add to that. Um, and, and, and a key point, it, it sounds like, like a, a Capitol Hill talking point when I say it, but it really has real meat on it, is that we have to understand this is not just a China threat to the United States. This is a China threat to a free, open, inclusive Indo-Pacific. And if you buy that, then that means that, you know, hey, other people care about this too. You know, Australia, they care. Hey, Japan, they care. Hey, India, they care. And if you start to build a more, I'm not talking about a NATO, let's not go down that silly path. I'm not talking about a NATO, I'm talking about increasingly unified, a real world military capability uh, that we can employ. And, and you know, if I'm a PLA planner, you know, an increasingly unified and capable quad, that's like a nightmare scenario. If you look at a map, I mean, that's not good. And so I'm all about building out the quad to make it much more than it is. It's gotta be more as HR McMaster says than good mood music at cocktail parties. You know, we, we really have to kind of bring real capability to bear here, but Brian, I know, and Tom and others and McKenzie have good thoughts. Right, yeah, I think there's a good question for anybody to jump in on, please. So I'll say, you know, one thing we have to think about with China is uh, they could be a most stressing, there could be a lot of most stressing scenarios with China. So we kind of think of China invasion of Taiwan is the most stressing situation we might face. Well, they could blockade Taiwan for two years. They could blockade, you know, Taiwan cyber, using cyber and economic tools or physical tools. They could execute a long-term campaign of gray zone warfare with intensification periodically. There's lots of ways they can stress out our force and not just in terms of, you know, capabilities we need in a short duration invasion of Taiwan. It could be a protracted uh, operation that we just don't have the capacity to sustain. Um, so the fact that, you know, they've got lots of options they can pursue means we need more options to be able to counter them. Uh, and that gets to posture, having a, having a posture that's you know, more robust than we have today with a more of a diversity of capabilities um, gives the Chinese more things to think about in terms of ways that we could pursue uh, you know, countermeasures to them. Uh, and you know, to Tom's point earlier about you know, he was talking about denying uh, China the ability to invade Taiwan. And I think you know, what we're talking about here is 
you know, making it so costly for China to invade Taiwan or so time consuming, it's no longer on acceptable terms for them. Uh, because I think sometimes when we throw the word denial out there, people perceive that as mean, we can stop them under all conditions from invading Taiwan. And I think when we throw that around, it sets the bar so high that it, it kind of instigates this defeatist kind of feeling on the you know, other side where they say, well, we're never going to stop that because you've got a, a country of 1.3 billion people against you know, a small country that's 90 miles away. If we can't deny them, then we should give up. So I think we need to make sure that we talk you know, about the fact that we are trying to raise costs and increase the likelihood of the, the Chinese not being successful on their terms. But that gives the idea of having more options and that's posture is the thing that enables those options. Who else? I mean, I'm still interested in the issue of provocation and how you balance, uh, I strike that balance, but Tom or Mackenzie, uh, you wanna jump in on any of that? You know, I, I was just gonna add that I think there's opportunities that maybe weren't there a couple of years in the Indo-Pacific. The Philippines has changed from trending neutral or negative to trending slightly positive. So I see all kinds of possibilities there. Maybe in you know, Australia, we just read about that. And with it, they get those nuclear attack subs, that'll be a huge game changer. So I think there's places in Japan, obviously, some places where we can increase our force posture and it's not gonna, you know, it's not gonna require, you know, like a breakthrough, like a Sadat, you know, agreement at Camp David or something like that. I think there's actually some, some things that we can be optimistic about. I would just add, Gordon, like in the most pressing scenarios point that Brian was making, you know, it's a it's a big, ugly question. People don't want to ask it. But what if the president, as commander in chief, says to take back the island? I mean, you need a really big army and capable Marine Corps to do that, for example. It could happen. That would be pretty pressing, uh, for example. But what I like about what my co-authors wrote, I can't remember whose line this was, but, you know, it's also important not to specialize to just one scenario. We wrote specifically in there, you know, in Washington, it's easy to think the only scenario is this fait accompli, you know, preventing China's fait accompli. But Russia has demonstrated through exercises and capabilities its ability to conduct its own fait accompli today in the Baltics if it chose to move. And so, you know, that's one of the reasons we call for. Um, focusing on our most capable competitors and being honest about the what they have already shown that they're, you know, be more honest, not just about what they have, but how strong we are relative to who they are today. Good. Um, Can I jump in real quick on that? Please do. I, I just, uh, Mackenzie mentioned Russia and it just, you know, it, it may, may be interesting to folks to kind of remind them that, um, you know, I was talking earlier about assumptions that are no longer true. Are, or are dangerous to continue to assume. Here's another one. The assumption that we could only confront a China challenge or war or a Russia war at, at one at a time. I think that's a bad and dangerous assumption. And I, and I say that because if you look what our intelligence community has said in their worldwide threat assessment a year or two ago, they said that China and Russia are more aligned than they've been since the 1950s. Now I'm not saying they're allies. I'm not trying to overplay that. I'm not trying to say there isn't some challenges and historical concerns in that relationship. But there is strategic level coordination going on between those two governments. They are doing military exercises together. And even if there was no prior coordination, if you're Putin and you see something unfolding in the Taiwan Strait, maybe that's the moment you roll the dice in the Baltics, even if there is no coordination, right? So they, there doesn't have to be coordination for you to end up in the same place where you're confronting simultaneous major combat operations. So if we're sizing our military for political purpose, assuming that we're gonna only place one MCO, one major combat operation, in my view, respectfully, that is a horribly dangerous assumption. Okay, interesting. Um, so uh, another great segue into let's talk a little bit more about some of these, um, uh, you know, allies and what is uh, kind of within the realm of the possible in the region and elsewhere. Um, uh, you know, I think we're starting to see a, a little bit more of a shift um somebody just alluded to a, a minute ago but uh, but there is an importance i think tom in particular uh, wrote about the the uh, importance for realism when it comes to uh allies there, there is like maybe a, a, a slightly changing narrative that uh, beijing may be losing the room a little bit um but i'd be interested to hear what you see as any evidence of that but then on the flip side, what's the what's the area of concern where we should be more realistic about what the allies are prepared? Yeah, thanks, Gordon. I think allies are perhaps the biggest comparative advantage that we have over our adversaries. They are the 
They are the secret sauce. They are the 11 herbs and spices that we have that Russia and China cannot even touch. I mean, you look at China's allies, if you put that in quotation marks, maybe that's North Korea. That, that'd be a great ally to have. And if you're Russia, maybe your ally is Belarus, although you know they run hot and cold. And so we really, compared to the, our adversaries, have a great web of allies and that we can count on them for basing rights, certain military capabilities. We use them to provide and convey international legitimacy on military operations. Um, and so, you know, we cannot ever take our allies for granted. However, I have seen, and I think there is probably some concern that I, I worry that we worry that in the next national defense strategy, somebody may use allies as a justification to say, hey, we're going to we're going to do less in this particular theater and therefore our allies will do more. And this has been said before in QDRs and things like that. And I'm speaking specifically of Europe, you know, this idea that if the if the United States kind of disengages a little bit, that others will step up to the plate. And while that sounds good and it looks good on charts, it, you know, it has not been our experience, you know, and you know, love or hate Trump with all the pressure that he put on our NATO allies. You know, we have 19 of about 29 NATO, NATO allies that are spending 2% of their GDP on national defense. And is 2% of GDP a magic number that is the best measure? No, but it's the, it's the, the only one we have really that kind of cuts across different economies on how much they are committed to national defense. And so We've got countries like Germany with the biggest economy in Europe, and they're spending 1.57 of their GDP on defense. And I don't, you know, they're not, they're not saying that's going to go up appreciably in the in the coming years. And so their armed forces are essentially dismantling themselves. Um, their current political situation in Germany is such that with the Social Democrats uh, taking the upper hand, you know, I, I'm I'm even more fearful than I was in the last couple of years. And you know, and that. That government couldn't even muster the resolve. I love those guys, but they could not muster the resolve to even buy an armed drone like a predator. So they're, they're willing to buy drones, but they're not willing to put any armament on them, which is, you know, I don't think they understand quite the deal with drones. And so, you know, love our allies. But before we start saying that Japan's going to step up and Japan, again, love them, but they spend 1% of their GDP on defense and they, they buy great stuff. They have great destroyers and a great fleet. But to think that just because we write it in a national defense strategy, that all of a sudden our other allies are going to step up and cover uh, U.S. interests in other places, I think is a fallacy. Good, thanks. Um, anybody else can uh, jump in, please do. But I, I'm also just interested in, uh, do you see a changing narrative, uh, again, in the Indo-Pacific particularly, uh, in terms of the U.S. and China, we saw AUKUS and we saw Australia kind of really, you know, align itself in recent weeks. What, what say you? That, that's a huge move. You know, we got a new uh, Japan uh, prime minister. I don't know where he's going to go. Uh, maybe Brian has some thoughts on that. So AUKUS is a big deal. AUKUS is going to have to cut. And Brian again would know better than I do. You know, to to start a nuclear attack submarine program, they are going to have to vastly increase their defense budget. And so. That'll be the real test. You know, when the president and the prime minister sign agreements, that's one thing. When the Australian uh, parliament actually ponies up the dollars to build these nuclear submarines, that'll be a sign as well. But I, I defer to Brian for more thoughts on that. Yeah, it's a big, so the, the Australians had already committed, you know, 90 million, or I'm sorry, 90 billion Australian toward this uh, effort. So it sounds like they're willing to put the money against it. That was one of the reasons that convinced the United States to go in on sharing nuclear technology with Australia. Uh, so it's a, it's a significant sign that the U.S. felt like the commitment was there such that they would actually share it because uh, the fears before, this is also pursued in previous years. Uh, and the reason we had not shared the technology was a lack of confidence in Australia's ability to kind of stay the course and actually manage it in a way that would be responsible and secure uh, and not reflect badly on the United States as the source of the technology uh, at the start. Uh, but I think the big thing is that's going to come out of this is the ability to have uh, submarines based on the western coast of Australia, you know, nuclear submarines at a nuclear capable base. Uh, that should happen earlier than they actually start delivering submarines. But that because that means U.S. submarines can start operating in Perth as well, which uh, would be great for our presence. And it's also a terrific liberty port. So I think that's great for the Navy. <laughs> and I would just add, Gordon, as Brian knows better than me, the, uh, but some of the viewers may not know, is that America's uh, attack submarine fleet is actually getting smaller right now. 
So at a time when, you know, that is one of our great- and One has a bump in it at the moment. I'm sorry? One has a bump in it because they just uh, <laughs> bumped into right. something in South China Sea. That's- Right, 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 right. right. Yeah, no, I mean, and, and that capability, that Virginia class attack summary capability is a, is a wonderful capability that causes real problems in a variety of ways for our adversaries. But that fleet is actually getting smaller because we're not replacing the Los Angeles class submarines as quickly as we should with Virginia class. And so bringing on some additional Australian capability eventually will be a wonderful thing. But, you know, Brian, what, we'll be lucky to have those in the water in what, 15 years? I mean, that'll be success, right. 10, 15 years, yeah. right, give or take, a long time. Yeah. And yep. this is one of the key things that I think some folks missed is that AUKUS, you know, the, the sub deal, which is wonderful and important, got a lot of the press, but it really, it's not a new alliance, right? We already have an alliance with Australia. It is a military technology cooperation through which hopefully a lot of other things will flow. And hopefully many of those will come along online sooner because, you know, if you look at what Indopaycom and others are saying, right? We could have a, a problem in the next six years in the Taiwan Strait. So you, you're talking 15 years from now. I, I'm almost uninterested. Just as long as we're on that, Brian, do you want to talk a little bit about the uh, uh, modernization? Uh, I think you stated the uh, U.S. is doing uh, modernization of its nuclear and its conventional forces. Do you want to just kind of uh, lay down some markers on that, please? Yeah, so, so the challenge, one of the big challenges that we're facing, and Mackenzie has talked about this uh, as well and done some great writing on it, is that we're simultaneously modernizing our conventional forces as well as our nuclear uh, our nuclear uh, forces and, and the infrastructure behind them. So it's an enormous bill that, that's coming due uh, because we've been taking, we've sort of been riding that Cold War investment for the last 30 years and are finally having to pay it off because we extended the lives of uh, a lot of conventional platforms and systems um, out to the point where they're no longer extendable. And same thing with the nuclear uh, forces. So re we're recapitalizing the, the strategic uh, submarine force uh, with the, the Ohio class getting replaced by Columbia. Uh, we're replacing the ground-based strategic deterrent with the follow-on to Minuteman. We're replacing the B-50 or the, the bombers with uh, the B-21, uh, which will replace you know, some of the B-1s and B-52s that are older now. Um, and then we're also on the conventional side, replacing a large number of our ships. We're replacing, we have a huge ground modernization program going on. Future vertical lifters replacing our helicopters. So simultaneously, we're replacing all this Cold War kit that we bought near the end of the, the Cold War. And then now we finally have, have, have got to... Uh, do something with that uh, force that's that's going to reach its retirement age. Um, that bill is is pretty enormous, um, and I think you know. Uh, Mackenzie and uh, Commander Salamander have heard that as the terrible 20s. Uh, and that is the challenge that we're facing right now. So one thing the United States has to figure out is how to pay that modernization bill while simultaneously making its posture more robust uh, and being able to maintain the readiness of the force for today so that we don't leave this gap you know, over the next five or six years in which an adversary could perceive us as being vulnerable. Uh, I, I want to go to Mackenzie and talk about money in a minute, but just while, because you touched on it and it, you're a, 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 a ship guy of knowledge, uh, um, you know, the number of ships is always seen as kind of a great benchmark, right? Um, can, can the U.S. figure out, and this is not necessarily a strategy question, of course, though it is, is uh, can the U.S. build more ships and uh, build enough of them at uh, low enough cost to get to make an effective naval force again. It can. So that you know, the Navy has been aspiring for the last 15 years to try to get above a 300 ship Navy uh, and on it being unable to do so. Uh, so we're still hovering right around 297 ships today. Uh, we, the Navy could build more ships. It has to make smarter decisions about what kinds of ships it buys. Um, yeah, it, it's, uh, it's gone through several situations where it's thrown a lot of money against a ship that never paid, paid off, like the DEG-1000. Um, they've uh, putting money into today frigates uh, and the Arleigh Burke destroyer, which should help the build up the fleet's numbers going forward. Uh, the Virginia class submarine has been a success, building two of those per year. Um, you know, but the, the problem is they're replacing ships that we were buying at three, four, three to four per year during the Cold War. So the, the fleet is going to shrink uh, or it's going to stay the same, but we're going to see a rebalancing of the fleet. So what's going to happen is we're going to have more of these smaller ships like the littoral combat ship uh, and the frigate and fewer of the bigger ships like the cruisers, which were likely to retire the destroyers um, and uh, and uh, bigger amphibious ships. So those are all leaving the fleet being replaced by a smaller shed, set of ships going forward. So that rebalancing is is going to make the fleet you know more numerous perhaps, uh, but not necessarily more capable. Great. That's a topic, obviously, uh, unto itself. But um, uh, we only we only have a, a few minutes here, so I want to make sure we get to uh, to more of it. Mackenzie, you are always my uh, my go-to on uh, issues of resources and money. 
and budgets. Um, you know, so all this, you know, sounds potentially great, um, but obviously there is a political reality and there's a, you know, budgetary and bureaucratic reality. Give us a snapshot of how you see any of this, you know, if, if policy is budget and budget is policy, how does it, how do those two get reconciled? So strategy, where's a dollar sign, right? But we say it should strategy should be threat led and budget informed. So, you know, not irrespective of spending, you know, you have to consider uh, how much something costs and prioritize no matter your strategies, there still has to be prioritization uh, underneath that, um, those main objectives, but uh, that's not what we're seeing in DC right now, right? So. The previous Pentagon leadership, plus then the Strategy Commission, led quite ably by Ambassador Edelman and former CNO Gary Ruffhead, endorsed the three to five percent, you know, annual overinflation target as the minimum, and increasingly, uh, and then all over pages of the Wall Street Journal today, Gordon, and your publication, it's just about you know all the red flashing warning signs of inflation, right? easily probably going to look back on this quarter and it'll be easily over 5% uh, the next quarter too, right? And for the Defense Department, which, you know, contracts out most of it, basically most of the money that goes in goes back out the door in some form of pay, salary, services, equipment, their inflation is actually typically higher than the overall economy. So a budget that doesn't even keep pace with inflation, we can't pretend like the strategy can can be met. And so it's one of the reasons, you know, Jim Mattis also said, um, you know, Secretary of Defense in the last administration, America can afford a strong defense. Of course we can. It, it's really about prioritizing choices also in, in the federal government, right? With the COVID blowout bills that, you know, increase every federal agency's spending with no year dollars, except defense, with an infrastructure bill for many other agencies, except defense, and then a 22 budget that only puts one agency on a diet, the Department of Defense, a, a fiscal diet, it would be unserious to propose to write a new strategy that is either the status quo of the last one, which I doubt, or additive, like I said, and a flat budget. Um, so we're hoping that they don't have this cart before the horse thinking. I want to come back to that, but anybody else want to jump in on just resources because it's yeah, I, I do. And uh, I'm optimistic today, maybe the first time in a while. And that is, uh, you, you know, McKenzie said this is a political decision, how much to put against uh, defense. But in, in our system of government, both Congress and the executive branch get a vote. And what we have seen in the last couple of months is that Congress kind of pushed back against the Biden administration's anemic budget request. And so they're well, you know, most people think in this town that they're going to add some $24, $25 billion to the 2022 defense budget request, and it will bring that budget request up to uh, 3%, I think 3% on top of inflation. And so it, it's going to be a hard, painful thing. It may have to be done every year versus uh, in a, in a deliberate plan on the part of the administration. But I think these congressmen are seeing the intelligence reports, they're watching the news, and they're voting uh, based on what they feel versus some kind of ideology that says that national defense needs to shrink. Look, can I, Gordon, can I jump in on that? I completely agree with Mackenzie and Tom on both all, all their points. And, and, and just let me foot stomp what Tom just said so that the listeners understand that. The, the Biden administration submitted a defense budget proposal that didn't, wouldn't even keep up, not even close with projected inflation, as Mackenzie just said. And then the Senate Armed Services Committee Equal, Demo, equal Republicans and Democrats, give or take, and then in the House Armed Service Committee and the entire House of Representatives all agreed and voted in an overwhelming bipartisan way that they should add roughly $24 billion to what the Biden administration requested. And these are people who are getting the classified briefings about what our threats are doing. They're getting the briefings about our readiness and these sorts of things. And so, you know, if anyone said, oh, okay, well, you know, here you go, you're arguing for more defense. You know, we're, we're, we're spending ourselves into defense oblivion. We can't afford this. Well, can we at least agree on some facts? Here's two facts, right? And that you and I can send you the numbers to prove it. And, and Mackenzie knows these far better than me. As a percentage of federal spending and as a percentage of GDP, we are spending near post-World War II lows. So next time, listeners, you hear a politician saying it's defense that's causing all these problems, remember those two numbers. Those are facts. 
and, and even if we were spending high fire, uh, much higher amounts, right? You prioritize things related to security and survival, right? Otherwise, nothing else really matters. So uh, I just wanted to put those two numbers on the table. Yeah. And uh, Gordon, one thing I would add to that is if uh, inflation is going to be 5% this year, uh, then that addition that Congress made to the bill or, or to the budget is probably going to be eaten up in a lot of ways by inflation. So we're going to end up kind of back where we were to start with, and so, uh, it, which is unfortunate. Um, and, and the other thing is that um, by adding that money, Congress is, of course, helping get you know defense back up to where it should be. Uh, but ideally, the the administration would absorb that, you know, take that idea on, and in the next budget, incorporate that twenty five billion up front, so they can actually spend it on things that they think are most important to give us an edge, as opposed to Congress having to add it at the end, where they've only got so many ways they can use that money. If you're if you're Congress at the very end of the budget cycle, you can buy more of what you're already buying, but you can't buy something new that doesn't exist today. And that might have been a better way to spend the money if the department had, had you know, adopted a higher top line to start with. Uh, just uh, Mackenzie, back to you or anybody, but uh, you know, uh, Mark Esper with his night tour at the Army, and then I think he tried to bring the same approach to um, when he was uh, SecDef, uh, you know, cutting uh, inefficiencies and cutting defense budget. And that is how that whole strategy is how you're going to pay for this broader strategy. Is that valid or can it be done? Because it didn't seem like it amounted to much. I would argue that is just good governance, you know, with taxpayer dollars. It's your due diligence as part of the job, but any assumption that you'll generate one additional new dollar to reinvest somewhere else has proven over the last 15 years to never come true. The, the, they've gotten it right by getting it wrong every single time. Every service, every year, every time they've made a bogey, a budget bogey for assumptions of savings, they don't materialize because of partly because of that special defense inflation I talked about, uh, where the costs of goods and services and people just go up higher than inflation every year, even before this this year with its high eye popping number. Uh, so no, that's just and it and it doesn't rise to the level of it. It shouldn't be. It should just be something we all do as part of our jobs. It just it shouldn't be something that we do in the hopes of of new money. Um, just being responsible stewards of taxpayer money is the right thing to do. But it's right. It, it, I think nobody could disagree. And yet, but that's not going to pay for any of these. It's not going to yeah. uh, supplant the inflation issues or, or any other increases that you all uh, are arguing for. Um, uh, one other quick thing, which is just, I think in the piece, you, uh, you all argue for the sense of urgency, and there's always a sense of urgency, right? right? Um, but uh, the uh, Pentagon in particular is not known for its efficiency and speed when it comes to uh, you know, fielding advanced capabilities. The, the nine-year pistol that uh, General Milley talked about on the Hill a couple years back um, uh, characterized for us how important urgency is now and how it can be executed given that it's not it's not been, the Pentagon in particular has not been that successful in doing it in the past. Gordon, I can jump on that and maybe my colleagues can add anything they want. You know, there's an anecdote that I, I, uh, I cite a lot about um, trophy active protection system. This is an Israeli system that you put on tanks and armored vehicles that they fielded operationally in 2011. So it rockets, mortars inbound, it actually intercepts them so it never hits the, the vehicle or the tank. Um, the Israelis had that fielded in 2011. We didn't acquire that until 2019 when General Milley essentially became a four-star action officer, the Army Chief of Staff. We took that Israeli technology, put it on our M1 Abrams tanks, deployed those tanks to Europe to deter Russian aggression. Israeli technology, American tank in Europe deterring Russian aggression. Hey, cool, that's wonderful. But listen to the dates I just said, 2011 to 2019. That's an eight-year gap where you had U.S. soldiers around the world and takes and armor vehicles where they could have been better protected. So if you buy what we're saying about this frenetic military technology competition we're in with China, we can't afford to do it that way, right? Either one of two bad things are gonna happen. We're not gonna deter the aggression or we're gonna have service members not being able to complete their missions and come home safely to their families, both of which are unacceptable. So we have to do better in going from concept to field to capability. That's not a new thing. We've all been saying that our entire careers, we know that, but there is some good news, right? Gen uh, uh, General McConville, the Army Chief of Staff, uh, said yesterday that 24 of the 35 major modernization systems will be in the hands of soldiers in some form by fiscal year 2023. Hey, that's, you know, I, I want to learn more about that. I want to dig into the details, but if true, that, that's, that's great. You know, bravo, good. 
Um, but at the same time, in testimony earlier this year, you know, GAO found that uh, a 35% increase in, in defense department, major defense acquisition programs in the time required to deliver those initial capabilities resulting in an average delay of more than two years. So we, you know, so progress, yes. Continued problems, yes. Higher stakes for these problems, yes. So, so what do we do? You know, we don't want to just admire the problem and wring our hands about it. Well, again, going back to what Tom said, on our assets list are tech-savvy democratic allies. And many of those are in Europe, our NATO allies, Japan, Israel, all these things. And it can't just be little one-offs where we belatedly try to fill a capability gap. We got to get together more systematically upfront and identify intelligence of form requirements that we both have and then get to work on filling those as quickly and cheaply as possible, stretch our defense budgets further and get them in the hands of our, our, our respective troops. For Israel might use it in Syria, we might use it in the Taiwan Strait, doesn't matter. In many cases, it's a lot of the same capabilities and we need less anecdotal, more systematic cooperation with tech savvy democratic allies. Good, who else wants to jump in on that question? I, I wanna hit one aspect of it and that is, you know, there's, there's people in Congress, there's legislation proposed to, to increase the amount, the percentage of domestically sourced stuff and to only buy U.S. stuff. And that cuts exactly against what Brad's talking about. And so if we somehow get to a point where we're trying to source 100% of our defense articles in the United States, you know, we are going to deny the United States uh, military great technologies that it, across. We are going to irritate our partners and they are going to pull up the drawbridge too and only buy, you know, what's produced in their indigenous areas or maybe in the European Union. And so policies like that, which restrict where we can buy stuff, really, uh, I think, will work to the United States' disadvantage. Any, anybody else? Oh, good. Gordon, I was struck by uh, the vice chairman of the Joint Chiefs comments recently this month, uh, earlier this month, where he said, you know, the Pentagon, we're too risk averse, we're, we're unbelievably or remarkably slow. And I'm thinking, aren't you the head of the J-Rock? Like, so what are you doing about it? Stop complaining about it. Tell me how, what you did in your tenure where your responsibility is purchasing stuff faster. You know, I read, uh, you know, about Air Force software chiefs quitting with their mic dropping resignation letter saying we can't get anyone to pay attention to it, to us, uh, you know, to get capability out there faster. So, you know, I, I want less complaints and more, you know, action lists, more results. Our point. Uh, so we've got five minutes. I'm, I want to uh, give kudos to whoever came up with the name of your app at what to expect when you're expecting a national defense strategy. Um, uh, cute um, name there. I will read this last bit to you and then ask each of you if I can in the last four minutes to make a very concise response. You know what you read, but I'll, I'll put it here. Um, you know what you wrote. With threats to U.S. national interests on the rise, the consequences of producing an ineffective national defense strategy may be severe and could come quickly. Clear-eyed thinking about national interests, the threats America faces, and how the military can best deter those threats is urgently needed. Here's hoping the 2022 national defense strategy gets it right. Um, quickly, uh, what are your closing thoughts uh, on, 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 on what I just read? Anybody. I'll just kick off and say, hey, we we have to, you know, this, we sometimes fool ourselves. We've done this in our QDRs. I think somebody mentioned that. If we start to assume that our allies can do more, that uh, economic sanctions will change President Xi's mind, if, if things will come together in an absolutely spectacular way in favor of the United States, you know, we're just fooling ourselves. So we can't, we can't count on luck. We can't count on other things. We have to kind of forge our own destiny here. And and I'm hoping this national defense strategy dispenses with a lot of these hopes and prayers and actually uh, charts a reasonable path ahead. Thanks, Tom. Who's next? Brian? Yeah. So um, I think you know, the strategy, like we said, has to have a, a path to be able to, to deter uh, China and you know maybe defeat them in, in some conflicts, but I think it needs to be a realistic about the China threat. Needs to be realistic about the ways they can stress us, uh, and it needs to capture uh, a new way of uh, organizing and posturing our forces to be able to more effectively counter China. Uh, we can't just sort of continue to ride this um, approach of having dominance like we have in the past. So the last national defense strategy, I thought, it did a very good job of starting to you know, begin that conversation of how we need to re rethink posture, rethink strategy, operate differently. Um, that's what we're going to have to do going forward because we have to be more creative to deal with the China threat. What you got, McKenzie? So I'll let Brad have the last word as the organizer of today's event. But um, right, so not just urgency, right? Everybody really does need to go faster, but 
we said honesty and humility were the other watch words. You know, maybe it's time to be more candid that we're not as good as we think we are in a lot of ways, right? Uh, militarily and with our plans and our training and our war games and our everything, concepts and capabilities and onboarding new equipment. I mean, I think there's um, a, you know, the, the spectacular book, Why Air Force Has Failed, the first reason in the book is hubris. And we run the risk of all these rosy assumptions about how others might fight, how capable they are and how good or, or not we are. Um, I, I just, it's kind of time to, to be more, more honest, even if that is a little embarrassing, but maybe the embarrassment is what this system needs to go to do better and go faster. Good, and then in the last couple of months have shown uh, the, the, the perils of hubris. Uh, uh, I would think some would argue. Brad, your last, uh, your last. Well, those are tough acts to follow, but I'll try. You know, our, uh, both McKinsey and I spent a fair amount of time working in Congress, and, and and my colleagues follow Congress closely as well. And and I think we all would agree that if you're going to have a strategy that uh, withstands the test of time, that lasts beyond whoever happens to be in the White House right now, or whoever happens to be controlling the Senate then you have to create policies and strategy that engender bipartisan support. And to my patriotic, hardworking fellow Americans in the Biden administration writing the national defense strategy right now, I beg you, listen less to the pollsters and the uh, politicians and the OMB folks and listen more to the intelligence community and the combatant commands as you draft the national defense strategy. If you do that, you will, cra you will craft a, a 22 NDS that will stand the test of time and make our country more secure. If you don't do that, then you're gonna produce a document that no one reads that will be in the trash can before it's published. That's concise and and uh, and, and and interestingly put. Um, folks, uh, really appreciate your time. Thanks for uh, in including me here. Everybody, uh, uh, really great thoughts and food for a lot of more thought and, and conversation. But um, uh, thanks very much. And uh, that concludes our, our talk today.